Welcome Oakland County EMS providers to section four. This is OB in pediatric emergency. Today, covering section four is Dr. Tressa Gardner. Dr. Gardner is our professional standards review organization chair. And also with us is Bonnie Kincaid, the executive director of the OCMCA. And of course, myself, John Toit, the EMS system manager for Oakland County Medical Control Authority. Welcome back EMS providers to section four, protocol 4.1. Dr. Gardner, tell us all about it. Well, John, we've got some old, new, and changed protocols that we're gonna review today. The biggest takeaway, and what you're gonna hear throughout again and again through each one of these protocols is using your MyMedic card. So I'm gonna say it this time and I may drop it in every now and again, but know that anytime you're dealing with a pediatric patient, you should be using that My Medic card. It allows you to get the appropriate medications based on those kids' weights. And that is probably the most important thing that we can do as providers is understand the need for the correct medication dose. It's our biggest stress factor when we're dosing the small adult, which they are not. They are children. Protocol 4-2, childbirth and related OB emergencies. We really don't see a lot of changes through in the beginning of your normal assessment of the mother and child as you get the second patient, the normal management of a delivery. Where the changes come in are down lower, the management of the mother post-delivery. There's a significant risk for hemorrhagic shock. So you have to be prepared for that piece and reaching out to your med control if you're considering that piece because TXA may be something that you're going to be utilizing. Moving further down, they're also added a section on abnormal deliveries. I know that we've all done some emergent deliveries and you've seen that nuchal cord wrapping around the neck, shoulder dysocia, everybody's nightmare, or the breech position baby. And so they've given some thoughts and guidance for managing of those, as well as prolapse of your cord. So these are all very helpful and things that you're going to be managing in the field. They potentially could be managing in the field. And what do you do with them? One of the big complications of pregnancy that we all read about and hear about is preeclampsia and eclampsia. So when you're transporting a gravid mother, whether she is gravid still prior to delivery or even post-delivery, you can have preeclampsia. And I think that's a big area that we have to remember. And so what's been added here, a treatment for the severe preeclamptic patient. So when you see any of these signs or symptoms in a mother that has delivered recently or that is impending delivery, you need to make sure that you're activating your treatment arm for severe preeclamptic patients. And that would be the magnesium four milligrams in your protocol here. So the next protocol is 4.3, newborn neonatal assessment and resuscitation. So the big change here, team, is that they've given a definitive date for neonatal, and that's less than 30 days old. So that's the biggest one. And other than that, it's all pretty much the same. So pediatric altered mental status, a couple of different updates here. Once again, they're going to refer to the new protocol for defining the timeline of the neonatal birth, less than 30 days. And they offer also reference a 4.9 crashing patient, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Again, referencing the My Medic card. So I can't stress that enough. Use your resources that are available to you. When you're assessing your child, monitoring your oxygen level, and then consider the use of capnography. You're going to see the use of capnography being mandated now, and that is including in kids in peri-arrest or arrest children as well. So get used to that piece of putting capnography on everyone. You're going to check your temperature of your child and make sure you're following your pediatric fever protocol and the vascular access if they need an IV. And then again, following the Oakland County Diabetic Emergencies, this is 1.100, 1. 1, you're going to check their blood sugar. Protocol 4-5, respiratory distress, failure, or arrest. Not a lot of changes here. Once again, just utilizing your My Medic card. But other than that, everything is still the same, utilizing your albuterol and identifying the problem with their child. Do they need racemic epi and going through that piece? But then as I referenced earlier, this is where they're talking about in respiratory failure or arrest. You want to make sure that you're utilizing your capnography in the pediatric population. And then BVM is still the preferred method of ventilation for kids under eight. Remember, we can bag a child for a good long time and just make sure you're aware of your airway management procedure protocol. 
And then the last thing is monitoring EKG and at reference again to the pediatric crashing patient. Pediatric fever 4.6. Pediatric fever points out a defined temperature for the fever, which is 100.4 in Fahrenheit and 38 degrees in Celsius. You're going to follow your general hospital, pre-hospital treatment protocols. And again, the MyMedic card is referenced. You're going to treat the temperature if needed. And that was really the only change on pediatric fever. Pediatric seizures. Pediatric seizures, it references the general pre-hospital treatment protocol and it identified what you're looking for to classify it as a seizure that's going to need perhaps medication administered. And that's the tonic clonic generalized seizure. So that's a big change is making sure that you're recognizing tonic clonic generalized seizure in your child before you start administering your medications. It also recommends checking the blood sugar, which we've always done in the past, but if it's high or low, then you're going to refer to the 1.100 diabetic emergency protocol. And then if you have a patient that's not currently seizing, but is maybe postictal or has had a seizure, some of the things that you can do if they're not actively seizing is to check that blood glucose and manage the airway and do your general management for pre-hospital treatment. And that brings us to 4.8, safe transportation of children in ambulances. This one, there's quite a few changes. EMS providers, EMS administrations, you're going to want to look at this one closely. There's one line in here specifically forms really the direction of this whole protocol. Any pediatric patient that requires a child restraint system that is transported in an ambulance must be in an ACR. ACR is an ambulance child restraint. It's a subset of the child restraining systems. Keep that in mind. When not transported in an ACR, you must document as such and report to the MCA. So please review this protocol so that you understand how to transport a child. And then Dr. Gardner, you've been talking about this in several other protocols, the pediatric crashing patient impending arrest protocol. So this protocol basically is a summation of everything that we do on a regular basis when we're assessing a patient. What they've done for us is organize our critical actions within the first 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes. But we are already or already should be doing these with managing their airway, making sure that they have adequate respiratory breathing function, and thinking about during this part of it, do I need to add my capnography? And on an impending arrest, of course, you need to add that capnography protocol. And as we move down through circulation, starting your IVs and moving over to an IO quickly, if you can't get an IV within two attempts, and then continuing the monitoring with all your equipment, your SpO2, your non-invasive blood pressure, capnography, and your EKG. And all these actions should be done in the first five, and then it goes on to the first 10. So this is basically a protocol that just helps organize and structure for us where we need to be on critical actions with kids, the pediatric population. As we all know, these are the most difficult patients for us because they create, at least for me as a provider, it creates the most stress for me. When I hear that radio call that comes in with a bad kid, I'm running through all these steps in my head. And so this protocol is kind of like what we need to think about and what we need to be doing at five minutes, 10 minutes, 15, 20 minutes in managing that critically ill patient. Well, thank you, Dr. Gardner, for coming here and working with us with Section 4. Thank you, John. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Oakland County EMS providers, for joining us for Section 4. We'll see you in Section 5. <laughs>